Hello. Welcome to this um, recorded lecture. Uh, we are going to speak about social perception and behavior. <clears throat> and um, basically, we'll look at the development of these skills. Uh, well, because of the nature of the class, developmental uh, neurobiology. So, the foundations of social perception are include the ability to recognize faces and the ability to process information to process the dimensions and uh, of the face and um, and also information that is expressed by by a face facial kind of expressions um, also processing social information and the context around us uh, analyzing um, the information that we can communicate visually with our eyes, uh, the ability to share attention and direct attention to, you know, in the same direction like someone else. When you look at the angle of their eye, uh, which is joint attention, um, mirror neurons, how they contribute to social uh, perception. And then theory of mind, uh, or social perspective taking, the ability to take someone else's perspective. And then we will look at what happens when uh, these skills are not acquired normally. And um, we specifically speak about autism because that is the, the, um, uh, the disability that is marked, uh, kind of uh, remarkably impacted or um, attributed to difficulty with social perception. So the ability to process faces. There are many views, but of course, what is not um, disputed is that at birth, babies are able to relate to a human face, right at birth. Uh, at birth. And they are, you know, orient themselves, and they are fascinated by by a face. Experiments conducted about ten seconds after birth have demonstrated, you know, the this um, this information that babies are attuned to human faces. <clears throat> so there are views, but the more predominant view is that somehow you know of course we come to life with information we come to life with networks and we have basic information that that comes you know as part of um you know of, of, of the um kind of what happens before birth the maturation that takes place in the womb of course it is all based on information dna is information so the baby is born with basic networks and some basic information that would enable the baby uh, to survive and to be ready for sensory stimulation to kind of connect with the world around, um, around her or around him. So the ability, again, the, um, the idea is that there is the baby has some idea about human faces and orients himself or herself toward a face and is particularly focused and shows preference of faces to anything else. And um, with continuous stimulation by seeing people's faces, by interacting with them, by um, spending time with people and, and looking and seeing them, then the brain kind of dedicates particular areas um, to make them focus on the skill of processing faces. So the idea is that you are born with the with the basis or the basic foundation and then you know specialization takes place you know you become more sophisticated, more able to read the subtleties on faces as you grow and if there's something for example, that goes wrong as the case as is the case with autism then 
you will notice that the person cannot derive as much information from faces as someone else. So the process of socialization with others is going to you know, activate and strengthen the ability to read facial expressions, to, to relate more to faces, and to also reflect uh, you know, uh, these facial expressions yourself. And this may take months, may take years, So, <clears throat> um, that ability, for example, you know, how children are fascinated by faces. And, uh, you know, um, you can think of this. When a child, when a baby is born, the baby sleeps for 21 hours. So, 21 hours, they are only available for three hours for feeding and changing and basics and they don't have much um, much time to interact you know to to be engaged with with others so the window of time to to kind of work with them and and communicate with them is is limited uh, but the idea is uh, they sleep for 21 hours most of these 21 hours they spend dreaming so dreaming I mean, what do they dream about? When you dream, you see images, you see different, you know, forms, colors, this and that. What do they dream about? Um, dreaming, of course, is a whole science, and it is seen as a way to activate um, different areas of the brain, but mostly focused on creativity. Um, so, the idea is, or the question is, that dreaming that, you know, babies, newborns, um, uh, have, um, you know, for many, many hours after birth, these dreams activate brain networks and make the brain kind of help the brain connect. But the fascinating thing again, I mean, what kind of images do they see? What kind of things do they see? Um, and now um, th that shows also or suggests the idea that there are things that that they are born with that they are ready to to you know to kind of look at and and to process. Because I mean, what do you dream about if you don't have any images or anything that you come to to life with? The um, human, I mean, the babies, anything that is that looks like a face, even it doesn't have to be even a real face, anything that looks like a face, they, they are they orient themselves to, towards it. it. It attracts their attention strongly, especially um, when the, the person's eyes, like they are looking at me and my eyes are, are open. That is something that, that makes them more interested as opposed to someone who's looking with their eyes closed. Someone who is directing that their eyes, making eye contact with the, with the baby, uh, uh, that person will get more attention than someone who's diverting his or her eyes away from the baby. So, I mean, the idea, think about it. The idea is babies are born and they have a brain that is developing that needs to be populated with knowledge and to be to connect with the world and the channels that enable the baby to develop that uh, you know that knowledge and to make the brain uh, uh, you know connect these are the sensory mechanisms we have seeing hearing touching all of this so the baby comes with the readiness to be stimulated, you know, with sensory, um, through the sensory channels in order to make the connections. So they come with that initial basic readiness in order to be, um, you know, to, 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 to receive and to develop um, the brain, to, to receive sensory stimulation and to develop the ability um, and, and retain it. So, Eyes, 
communication with humans, that is a basic, essential um, uh, function that, that will serve as a major channel for the baby to develop. The baby has, you know, needs to look and process and imitate and, and, and follow. And as he or she develops with experience, they are going to acquire the knowledge that is necessary for them to survive in this world. So the anatomic areas or in, in the brain that, has ded that are dedicated to facial processing, um, these include, for example, the, an area in the temporal cortex and also actually uh, two areas in the temporal cortex above the ears and also the orbitofrontal cortex. Um, so I'll show you not that so i'm going to show you um this is the temporal cortex and this is one you know how it has low it has a gyri like like a little mountain you know hill and then between there's a valley so the temporal cortex has three gyri the superior the medial and the inferior now there are two sulci or two valleys between these two mountains. Here's this one. This one on top, we call it the superior. And this one, we call it the inferior. So if you kind of open up this, um, the, 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 you know, open up the top gyrus and the other one and just go like that, inside you'll see the connection between them. So the fibers that are that are buried between the superior temporal uh, sulcus, uh, I mean gyrus, and the inferior and the medial temporal gyrus, that is called the superior temporal sulcus. So that area is essentially important in uh, processing information about faces. There's also um, the orbitofrontal cortex is, is around here in the frontal part of the brain uh, here and, and the far front in the middle. And then if you take that temporal cortex and, and then just kind of flip the brain look from, from below, you are finding this um, green the green area here is called the fusiform gyrus. That area is particularly um, uh, specialized in facial recognition and processing. So um, one area, two areas, and three. These are the primary areas that are kind of, um, you know, they play a major role. And, and the processing of, face, of faces. In terms of directing your visual, you know, kind of looking and and um, following something with your vision, <coughs> one part that we studied before is the superior colliculus. So this is the brain stem, and this is a, a posterior view of the brain stem from behind. And you find two little areas, the green areas here. The inferior one, the, this is called the inferior colliculus. The, the top, the one on top of it is called the superior colliculus. And to understand the inferior colliculus, here's one, and on the other side, there's an identical one. They are specialized in processing of auditory signals, as we explained that before in the section on, on auditory processing. The superior colliculus integrates auditory information with visual information to make you direct your hearing, uh, your vision in the direction of what you, of the sound that you hear. So it also enables us to, 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 to track things with our eyes. So the ability, again, to, to detect someone else's eye gaze, um, we look at the, the 
portion of the white in the eye compared to the you know the the, the iris so looking at th that ratio is going to tell you what angle is the eye directed toward and that is significant information that we use so when you look at someone's eyes we know what direction he or she is looking and immediately as a reflex we tend to immediately direct our eyes in the same direction like someone else like if you see someone looking above like this immediately you are just going to go and look up you know what is going on why is this person looking like you know up there what is there so that ability is called joint attention and joint attention is essential in social development in language development uh, essential for cognitive development um, so the ability again it is perception of averted gaze when someone just looking at something else you you can identify what direction what the person is looking at and then you direct your vision towards the, the same thing so an illicit and uh, uh, automated shift in attention in the same direction uh, as someone else's vision allowing the establishment of joint attention so if you are sitting there and you look to your left and there's a cat coming and you kind of direct your attention i mean you look at it and i am sitting across from you and when i see your eyes kind of shifted away then i am going to be able to imitate to shift and direct my vision toward the same thing now once we have you know here's the cat and i am looking at it you are looking at it one same target we call this joint attention So joint attention is important for cognitive social language, uh, I mean social and language development. For example, a lot of the early vocabulary is acquired through joint attention. There, there will be a period of time as soon as the baby is able to interact, especially, um, you know, six, I mean, the baby can interact in many ways at birth but in terms of language and and to verbally kind of interact um they go through a a stage when they learn le uh, words new words very very quickly and they go around and labeling and stuff and so they look at you you kind of as you are interacting with them you look at something and say you know whether you point or not and then you label you name the thing look for example, direct your attention uh, to a tree and there's a bird singing and then you look and they look and say bird and then they repeat. So that is an essential um, uh, means of basically learning um, new, you know, like the vocabulary, the language and so on. And also focusing attention, the ability to direct your attention. So, because attention is um, is a skill that you actually have control over, and you direct it, and you suppress, um, for example, distractions, and then direct your attention in the in, in a you know in a direction voluntarily, uh, for example, in order to focus on something. Or so the idea is. Um, when you are in tune with someone else and look at them and they and you kind of inter interact with them and follow their attention you also are able to take their perspective you are thinking what i know what they are thinking about um you can even predict their actions so the um the um in terms of normal normal social development, eye gaze perception is is important for infant mother interaction. Uh, for example, um, there will be 
in the early in the first three months um, of life the baby is is interacting with the with the mother using visual contact and around three months or so they begin to make conversation with eye contact the mother looks at the eyes and the baby's eyes and waits until the baby's totally focused on her and then she says something very briefly and then the baby gets tired like in a couple of seconds and then they diverse his or her eyes away that means i'm tired and then they they go back again and uh, so mothers know instinctively that you know give them the time when they look away wait for them to take a turn to come back again and look so they wait and the baby looks again and then mother says something again maybe repeating the same thing and then the baby gets sad and shifts eyes and then the mother waits and then the baby looks again so they use that eye contact eye gaze back and forth as, as a way to regulate turns it is just like conversation but the baby doesn't have the language yet to make that conversation so they use eye gaze as a means uh, to engage in that uh, you know uh, in this kind of proto conversation kind of so all of these early interactions with the with the mother like this are going to be a foundation for social development joint attention emerges when you say emerges it's like kind of significant evidence of it um, you know is visible to us around three to four months but of course it becomes really robust about between seven and eight months so in order for a child to to respond well to social cues these cues first need to be preceded by a period of mutual gaze it's kind of you want to you know for example say something to, to the baby and smile and so you wait when they look at you you say something or make a certain sound and then they divert their attention then you need to give them that kind of break and they will not be able to process if you if you continue anyways and then once they look at you in, intently then they are ready to process the information so that period of mutual gaze is critical before you communicate before you say something to them or because like i said the baby's brain is working very very fast very quickly developing and growing and, and firing and consuming about 50 percent of all the energy all the food that they eat about 50 percent goes to the brain so they fatigue very quickly you know they if you you for example interact with them or they're experiencing they're learning something that they the brain is working very hard and kind of causes them to be exhausted basically so they are going to take breaks and if you try to activate during the breaks it's not the best time so as i mentioned before babies are tuned to the human faces even if you have like a balloon with a with a smiley face on it or or just a balloon with two dots it doesn't even have to be a complete you know face kind of they, they are attracted to it and sometimes they smile to it even if it's a balloon with two eyes um also <clears throat> infants tend to have the ability to imitate facial expressions and you can google and um, you'll find kids um go to youtube and you'll find many many videos with kids uh making the same face at two months of age or three like the the parent interacting with them like when the parent goes and the baby is going to round her her lips and will mimic exactly the same and you have read the article on um 
mirror neurons and we'll speak about mirror neurons and how they enable us to imitate others so the ability um, to predict the behaviors of others that is part of social processing um, it involves it involves several components number one you have to be able to perceive the action of others to to kind of process it and make sense of it what's going on around you and then you have to be able to attribute to to, to look at human beings as able to have goals and you know before they do something they have a they have an idea they have a goal and by being able to predict or to understand that goal you will be able to predict what they will do so for example you see me i ha i hold the cup what what is my goal you are able to predict now that here i am thinking about getting something to drink maybe maybe coffee if i am holding a different kind of cup you are going to predict oh my, his goal is to get water um so you are going to use this cues and and you'll be able to understand someone else's goals by getting reading social cues and by doing so you will be able to predict what they will do next the areas that are involved in um in predicting the behavior of others include again the superior temporal sulcus that i pointed out and and the frontal cortex which is in here these areas are particularly important for detecting biological movement and um, especially they are activated particularly about around age four months mirror neurons facilitate the ability to imitate movement of others and i'm going to explain i'll speak more about them they enable us to to kind of um uh, you know get, get social information um about others and and especially critical during development for example the short video the one and a half minute video that that you watched has a lot of information um social information and if you look at it you can really derive many many things that babies do uh, as part of the interaction with, with others you notice that the whole thing is based on you know making faces and of course the baby is not going to be making up these faces just out of nowhere these you know the baby had imitated the facial expressions he saw on the father's face the mother's face the relatives and so on and now he is using it that ability and when the parents and everyone else who is watching they are laughing the baby is getting feeling rewarded because he or she is now able or is able to do something and then they are looking and then he is able with that facial imitation that he makes he is able to elicit positive social interaction and that encourages him to do more and as you keep through that cycle of stimulation is going to lead to more production and then continuous practice the baby then masters these social cues and will use them effectively to make an effect on someone else so here again is the superior temporal sulcus and when you open it up you will find that the the two mountains kind of the the two um gyri are connected beneath of course 
So the very line that connects both of them and that is buried in between is that area that we are speaking about. And here is the prefrontal cortex and the, the areas that, that, that are, um, the area is here that is also important for facial uh, and social processing. Um, so now, the concept of theory of mind. This is a foundational concept. Um, it is a foundational element of social processing. Theory of mind is not a theory that someone wants to prove. Theory of mind is the ability to read someone else's mind and to have a theory about what someone else is thinking. You know, what kind of knowledge that, that does that person have? You basically build an educated kind of assumption about what is in that person's mind. How do they think? How much knowledge do you have? And without it, we will not be able to interact with others in a productive way. For example, suppose that a, a student in speech language pathology is going to our conference and she goes and sits on the plane next to, you know, someone and um, that person, they have a conversation and the student is quite enthusiastic and you know the the idea of say anatomy comes up a brain anatomy and the student uh, starts to to talk to the to the adult next door and, and say t saying um uh, how the brain does this and how the brain does that and how and, and kind of basically teaching or trying to teach the, the person about the brain and what it does <clears throat> At some point, she would discover that the person she is teaching about the brain is a neurologist or a psychiatrist. How will that student feel when she finds that out? Is that embarrassing? So, of course. So, how to have one way or, or theory of mind enables us to read, to predict what's in that person's mind. So, when we speak with that person, we do not tell them things that they already know. That we do not tell them things that they have no background at all. And they, for example, cannot connect with us. Um, so when you find, I mean, theory of mind enables you to have knowledge to, to predict or to kind of use what the person says, to use their facial expressions, to use how they behave, any information you get as you interact with the person, you use it as a way, as a way to read their mind. And as you know the person, you use theory of mind to regulate how you interact with him or her. You do not talk about things that bore them. You do not talk about things that make them angry or hate you, obviously. You speak about things um, or do things that you know, you know, for example, that will make communication better, that will make you uh, get along with that person. So you continuously kind of try to understand the person and build ideas about what they like, what they do not like, what theory of mind, in short, is the ability to understand that someone else has his or her feelings, his or her beliefs, his or her um, ideas and about things. And this is one thing, that they have knowledge as much as you do. I mean, knowledge exactly like you have knowledge in your mind, they also have knowledge in their minds. They have feelings, they have emotions, they have beliefs, and so on. And second is, that you understand that their feelings and beliefs and and um, and all of the, you know these things are as important to them 
as your beliefs and your ideas and so on are important to you. So you see them as equals, in other words. You see them as, um, you know, having, having knowledge, having feelings, having emotions, having beliefs. And also that the fact is that these beliefs and these feelings are as important as true for them or to them as your beliefs and feelings are to you. For example, you are a math professor. And you know, it doesn't take you, I mean, this is your area of expertise. You, you know, it doesn't take you long. You can just read a, a whole theory or take a bunch of problems and, and, you know, in a few minutes, just immediately solve them and so on. And then someone, a student who's just beginning to learn math, you know, struggling with an equation and all of this. If you kind of are unable to take that child's perspective or that student's perspective and see, you will not be able to make sense you would say wow this is so easy why can't they get it you know this person is stupid and and you make up all this because you think that since you know it and it's making sense to you here everyone else you know should should, should be able to do it it shouldn't be hard what is the problem with you guys or, or people <laughs> and the fact is a person like this that math you know or whoever it is uh, is going to be the one who has the problem. The problem now is not with the child, the student or who is starting to learn a skill. It, the problem is with the teacher or with the professor who is not understanding that this person's, this person has ideas, this person has knowledge, and this person's experience doesn't allow him to, to get to have exactly the same uh, knowledge, for example, as I do, and this is why this is difficult for them, and they don't have exactly to be exactly in the same way that I feel. So uh, the ability <coughs> to understand that people have feelings and emotions and beliefs and so on, and that these are feelings and emotions as are important to them for them as mine are important to me. Number three, that these beliefs and actions, I mean, these beliefs and emotions and so on, they do not have to be identical to mine, that they are different. They are most likely different than my own actions and my own beliefs. So this is a big concept. And if someone doesn't have that ability, they will have no ability to communicate and to connect in a positive way with others and not even speaking about internationally like from country to country but even in their own town or in you know where they share so much with others or in their own state or in their own country so it becomes harder and harder <clears throat> and you know as you get out of and expand your perspectives uh, about the world and and travel and see uh, other cultures and other people and how they behave that the ability that theory of mind enables you to grow in many positive ways to socially connect and appreciate and understand what others have and um and and know how to connect with them on an equal basis uh, in a positive way so theory of mind is an area that is the, the people with autism have have significant difficulties with theory of mind is not something that you either have or do not have it develops as a like in a on a continuum you it develops as, as a basic skill and then you build and build and build until you have you are able to kind of demonstrate efficiency in it by age four years so as you say some a child who is maybe uh, 12 months or um, 18 months of, of of age if she or he is communicating with you and you are not paying attention to to them say let's see <clears throat> you are reading something and the baby is you know comes and tries to to get your attention to do something or to 
whatever handing you a toy or asking for something and then you are reading so if you are continuing and uh, you are not shifting your attention to the baby the baby figures out in your mind here you are not paying attention to him or her in your mind you have something else that you are thinking about so they might grab your book and move it away or might even take your face and direct it to them so that you can focus on them theory of mind is important in repairing communication breakdowns when something is going wrong you are going to come up with the solutions oh she didn't understand me maybe i'm going to repeat it in a different way uh, oh she got offended maybe i should you know repair i should kind of apologize you know clarify and so on so we constantly watch the actions and the words of others and regulate our communication accordingly based on the theory of mind that we have and the more accurate we are in reading the social context in reading facial expressions in processing faces uh, the more accurate we are the more accurate the presumptions or the theory of mind that we form about that person and the more successful we are in establishing a positive relationship and connecting with that person in a way that will make a you know a, a good productive relationship um other people who have who might have difficulty with social um, theory of mind uh, might be some <coughs> people with adhd uh, and, and and some some in some forms uh, especially the kind of hyperactive and impulsive kind of um, you know um, category there is a network or a circuit for facilitating or uh, you know theory of mind or for mediating theory of mind and this includes four brain structures the the first the medial prefrontal cortex again that is engaged in so in facial processing um it's involved in monitoring one's own thoughts uh, you kind of keep thinking about how how you are thinking am i getting it right am i uh paying attention to this person should i do this should i do that so constantly making judgments evaluating your own your own um ideas about that other person and then the temporal um, parietal region let's go back to an image here so here is the temporal cortex or temporal lobe here i'm sorry take it back parietal lobe and here is the temporal so when you say the temporal parietal you can go back here and the area where the temporal lobe connects with the parietal lobe you know this area here that that the extension of this you know green green line so this area and <clears throat> the parietal cortex is a sensory it, it just has like a map of all the sensations of your body it makes sensation possible and it also has an area here that integrates visual and and uh, tactile you know so the feeling of touch and and um the the feeling of the movements that you make and uh, proprioception and visual information so now you have the temporal lobe that has language information that has auditory information and now connecting with the tactile and sensory and connecting with the visual cortex so you have vision have hearing and you have tactile uh, inputs okay, all integrated and then you have the amygdala which is the emotional processing so you are in, engaged with someone speaking with someone for example or or you know communicating with them in one way or another and you kind of vi visually monitoring 
and integrating what you hear with what you see with the actions and the person is is making and the and the facial movements and the body gestures and also now that's affecting your emotions are you feeling positive are you feeling nervous about this person are you feeling encouraged this and that so your amygdala is constantly involved in the evaluation of social and non-social information <clears throat> about you know involved in your communication with this person uh reading signs of danger reading signs that, you know um th that will make you kind of avoid um uh, negative consequences and negative things that could affect that uh, relationship uh, or communication that you are having and then the inferior temporal region which is that we looked at the at the very uh, kind of lower area of the temporal cortex here and and this is if you go down here you'll find the fusiform gyrus that that, that i identified earlier So here's the amygdala again, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, we'll speak about it uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, is the prefrontal cortex, the, the medial area is, 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 is one that we talked about, and here is that the, the line between this gyrus and this is, is what we also mentioned. Uh, but for this, um, the temporal parietal region, the amygdala, and then the inferior temporal region, so they, they are all involved in, in processing faces and reading faces because there's so much emotion that we, we exhibit with, on our faces, and of course the amygdala is central in that. Now, motor neurons have a a group of them a cluster of them i made some modifications here uh, are called mirror neurons so these mirror neurons are visual and motor neurons and they represent action the action done by another individual as a potential motor action so for example um you look at someone and they kind of proceed they're starting to go do something and then you kind of you know kind of tend to 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 mimic them a lot of this by the way happens in a very very subtle way through facial expressions when you look and someone has a certain facial expression and you look and you are frequently interacting with this person your facial expressions tend to resemble to be you know similar to that person having lived with that person for a long time um so motor neurons enable us to kind of see and mimic see and imitate and they are critical in the early stages of development because imitation is a big way a big tool for babies to learn how to imitate how to learn the skills from others and and around eight months it becomes a, a primary tool for them to learn uh and, and different kinds of information for example you say something and they, they look at you and see how you are doing it how your lips are behaving how your face is behaving and they mimic it and do the same um so that is important for social learning and social uh, processing the the ability to 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 read faces and to imitate faces facial expressions is going to enable the person to predict what the person is what, what the other person is thinking about you predict their intentions and um, when they you are able to predict their intention you are able to to predict their action. So mirror neurons could in principle provide, provide us with an experience-based understanding of observed actions. Someone is doing something, you imitate because you can do it yourself here, 
then you can understand why they are doing this. Uh, it enable it is experience dependent. You do it, you get it. Uh, which is a basis for understanding the intention of others. So again, um, we have here two things: motor, visual connected together, and enabling you to basically mimic what other people are doing. And by doing so, when you mimic it, you feel it, you can predict now what they are going to do. You can predict, um, you, you build some understanding about their intentions. So mirror neurons contribute significantly to social cognition and the um, impairment in autism and, and social cognition is is largely attributed to deficiency in mirror neurons uh, to to some kind of impairment uh, or, or or abnormality in how mirror neurons function and um, these uh, these kinds of motor neurons are said to be probably the most basic system and the, that the brain has for understanding other people's intentions. I'm quoting sometimes because the, 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 the quote is, you know, uh, is, is kind of con condenses in the best, in the best way uh, what the inform I mean, what I want to say in terms of the information. So there are several areas in the and the brain, human brain, where mirror neurons are, are found. Um, and just to give you a basic idea, for example, in the um, inferior parietal lobule, so that means it's an area in the, in, in the parietal lobe here, which is like the crown of the head, um, intraparietal sulcus, ventral um, premotor cortex, that is in the, in the frontal part here again, and the posterior sector of the inferior frontal gyrus, uh, again the inferior, uh, the um, uh, the areas we are talking about are frontal areas here and parietal areas here, because the parietal areas enable you to have sensation so when you are moving part of your body in a certain way you know uh, or moving it at all you get sensation about how it is oriented what direction it, is it moving how does your muscle or 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 finger or hand how do they feel as you are making a certain movement and without that ability it, it would impair us significantly if we do not have body awareness and feel our body behaving and moving in space. So, um, and in terms of uh, uh, mirror neurons, these fire, they are activated when the person is performing a motor action or when the person is observing someone else doing something. For example, if I have a hammer, which I think I do here, make it the point. <laughs> so I have a hammer and I am doing this now. My motor cortex is now activated to actually enable me to physically move my hand this way as I hold. My parietal cortex is activated to make me feel the, the, you know, the hold here and then the grip on this and to make me feel the, the texture uh, you know, of what I am holding. Um, my visual cortex, of course, is activated you know, in terms of looking at the shape and configuring it. So now as I am going like this, holding a hammer, even without saying the, the word hammer. The word hammer is activated now in your brain. You recognize it. When I go like this, your motor cortex is as much activated as my motor cortex. 
So, so as a, and it mimics the action that I am mimic uh, that I am doing now. However, you have the ability. Your brain has an ability to suppress doing this physically. A baby, my, uh, you know, very young. <clears throat> If you go like that, may mimic you exactly like this, or hold the pen or something, and go like like this. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, <clears throat> the all yeah, like when there's so many, you know, like videos and and uh, TV programs and 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 physical things that that kids are exposed to, and they want they observe and see, and they imitate that. And there are many experiments that you can just Google how violence, how the babies are affected by violence. They would show, for example, videos, I mean experiments, where someone would have a, a dummy and they have babies observing from outside and, and, and looking at someone in a room kind of kicking a dummy or and, and you know slapping it and doing something that that's they're not supposed to do and then now the person goes out and then they have the baby go in i mean a child basically uh usually um you know you know a year or older and then they observe the baby by himself or herself right in that place and they mimic exactly what they had seen they kick and they do similar things and they show the same the same pattern of violence as the other person these are experiments are were conducted to to demonstrate how simply observing a violent scene in a movie is going to make the baby do that i ha uh, there was a i was at a place at some point where we had a a, a gathering a show and the 10 year old a 9 year old a uh, boy who is a master um, kind of karate, uh, you know, skilled karate player, and he, he has moved, he, you know, appeared in a, some Hollywood movies and so on. And so he was doing that demonstration and, and really amazing. And there were many kids who were two years old, four, five, and then two years old, uh, three, and, and, and four, and so on. As soon, there was a break after the demonstration was made, and and the you know the child sat and um, and the show was kind of you know over, and there was a, a a lull like a little break, and you see these all these children, two years old, three, walking around and mimicking and doing these movements, and that that this child was demonstrating. So it's amazing again how these children use their mirror neurons to be able to emulate, to imitate the actions of others. So, you know, and that, that goes from the simplest, smallest, most subtle imitations of facial expressions and so on, to the physical, you know, motor, um, gross motor movements and things that you actually do with your legs and hands and the rest of your body. So, as I mentioned, motor neurons and uh, mirror neurons or motor neurons as a matter of fact in general uh, they are activated by simply hearing when i say the word hammer you hear the word hammer if i say i was hammering a nail you see that in your brain and your motor areas get activated and and kind of exactly like you are as if you were hammering but you suppress there are mechanisms to suppress that physical action and prevent it from going to your arms and going like this. When we go to sleep, motor behavior, whatever you do motorically, what you like walking, running, uh, you know, using, uh, looking at other people doing things, all of these um, behaviors, are processed in the first part of sleep, in the first stage of sleep. So you go from the gross motor, heavy actions and so on, 
and you go to the most abstract at the end of, of the sleep, so, you know, uh, the last phase. So you notice, for example, at the very beginning, when you go to sleep, and in the first, the transition between wakefulness, from wakefulness to sleep, that area where you feel like you haven't fully fallen asleep, we experience hypnagogic dreams. At that time, the, the frontal cortex is not yet disengaged from the rest, you know, other areas. The motor cortex <coughs> um, is still very much connected with the prefrontal cortex that makes intentions, voluntary movements possible, and so on. So at that period of time, when you, you start to disengage a little bit, from the motor cortex. The motor cortex is processing all these movements and everything that you did. And you start to have these dreams where you're gonna fall off the bed or you, you just your hand jerks. Instead of dreaming this in your mind without behaving, at these moments in that transition, your hand physically, you know, um, or you get startled. So you can't suppress the motor movements that your brain is processing. Because, you know, at that time you haven't fully fallen asleep. The prefrontal cortex that, that mediates um, voluntary movement is, is kind of starting to disengage. So it's not completely disengaged. And the movement that your brain is, is, is kind of rehearsing is demonstrated into or translated into physical motor behavior. But in your wakefulness, as we are awake, when I say hammering a nail, your brain gets it, your motor cortex is activated, but it doesn't cause activation of your hand because there are mechanisms to suppress it. So. The, the idea of the motor neurons, again, they can be activated by auditory stimuli, um, things that you hear. When you say someone climbing a tree, and then the motor system now sees, goes through the same motion of as if you are yourself climbing the tree. <coughs> so, mirror neurons generate an internal represent, a representation of the actions even when that action is not visible as as i you know explained like if you say i was running outside and immediately that is not visible to you you do not see me running but your brain is going to be activated as if yourself you yourself are running So I'm going to read you this uh, quotation uh, simply because, you know, it's really important. Um, recent studies suggest that defects in the human mirror neuron system contribute to some symptoms of autism. So we have now theory of mind. It is well established that they, uh, people with autism have difficulty with that. And now mirror neurons are, there's evidence to show that people with autism have deficiencies in the mirror neuron system. Whereas the motor system of a normally developing child is activated when he observes another person performing an action, this activation is lacking in children with autism. And they use neural imaging, of course, to do that. As a result, autistic children may lack the neuronal mechanism that normally mediates direct experiential understanding of the intentions of others. They can't read, they can't predict, you know, what, what someone else is going to do based on the mirror neuron system. Autistic children who are able to understand the behavior of others are thought to use cognitive inferential processes to compensate for the lack of a functional mirror neuron system. 
So when you use cognitive skills now to perform something that's supposed to be automatic, that is going to divert your attention and memory from something else. It will it will cause cognitive overload when 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 you kind of <coughs> they have to kind of use cognitive abilities to compensate for more mirror uh, neuron dysfunction. Uh, I just wanted to point out here that politically. Uh, we should not be saying autistic children. We should not be saying um, uh, learning disabled children, because we are not supposed to describe to, to, to make the disability the person into the person. So the politically correct way to to say it is people with autism, individuals with autism, um, and so with instead of you know describe. But this is a kind of a Now let's look at autism uh, as an example of uh, difficulty um, or abnormal development in social perception. So autism is a, a develop, neurodevelopmental disorder. It is not progressive. So people are born with it and it doesn't you know, progress. Um, the major features of the diagnosis, of course, you can refer to the DSM Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and the fifth edition is the current one, was produced 2013. Uh, what I'm going to focus on here <coughs> are the basics as they pertain to the discussion we are having. I am not in the business. I mean, this is not the situation where uh, we are going to speak about the details of um, the diagnosis and so on. We are going to take this in, um, in the neurodevelopmental disorders uh, course. So, but we'll focus on the early markers and the early um, de de development, for example, of autism. So, the major diagnostic features include impaired social interaction. That's the primary one. Impaired verbal and nonverbal communication. And that also has to do with social communication. A restricted in interests and stereotype behavior. The rate, of course, is 1% in the US population. <coughs> and there was, of course, uh, you know, there's so much conflicting data. And um, a study that came out um, about three years ago, or maybe approximately, saying even one in 89. So whatever the, the reason for this um, diagnosis becoming more or less, that is not what you are focusing on here. But the idea is about 1% in, in the U.S. population is you know, are diagnosed with ASD. 50% have intellectual disability. And the rate is consistently higher in males compared to females. So for every four males, you have one female. And then the category who, who do not have intellectual uh, disability, you have eight boys, one female. <clears throat> uh, the diagnosis or the, the disorder is identified before age three. And I will tell you some early signs that are very important. And it affects basically all countries, all ethnicities, uh, all over the world. Genetically, 10% of the cases are attributed to genetic, uh, genetic markers. And uh, the father's age is a factor. The older the father is, the more likely the child, I mean, the, 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 the more likely that this uh, father will have a child with autism. The mother's age also, the, the older the mother is, the more likely she would have a child with autism. Now, it doesn't mean that anyone, in like, for example, anyone who's older 
uh, mother or father is, 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 is going to have a child with autism. No, we're not saying that. We're saying if you take all the kids, I mean all, all people with autism, you will find that many, many of them have are born or were born to fathers and to mothers who are older. That's what we are saying. So uh, it's the same for, for Down syndrome. But it doesn't say necessarily say, yeah, uh, if you, someone is older, they definitely will have a child with Down syndrome or with autism. There are environmental causes for autism. And there are also epigenetic factors like I mentioned before. Some, For example, one of the, um, I mean, several studies kind of suggest that at the very second of conception where the, where the uh, sperm hits the egg and it goes and, and it starts to mix the, the father's DNA with the mother's DNA, at that point in time, the genes and they just get a little bit disorganized and something goes wrong at that very, very earliest second of, of, of conception. For some um, environmental reason, um, but, you know, so that is an example of epigenetic uh, changes that could happen at that moment of conception, for example. The vaccine question we heard <coughs> in the past, this controversy, and uh, there were a lot of, there was a lot of politics involved in it and all of this and the war against vaccines. The question has been settled for a number of years now. Vaccines are not the culprit to cause autism. So, so it has been verified over and over, and vaccines are not a cause of autism. There are no biological markers, like in other words, to make the diagnosis. There's no particular uh, gene to go and say, you have it, you certainly, you don't have it or have this gene you certainly are going to have autism. No, autism is diagnosed more on a behavioral basis by observation, by uh, through rating scales, through interactions with the child, and using a list of criteria in the diagnostic statistical um, uh, uh, manual of mental disorders that psychiatrists and neurologists use uh, to say, okay, if you have this, and that then, you know, you are going to have the disorder. Now, signs that emerge by the end of the first year include the following. No turn, uh, I mean, no turning of the head when you name, you call the baby's name. They don't turn their head. They are not oriented towards you. Preferring to play with objects rather than to, to interact with humans. Now, you have to be careful with this. There will be a stage about between one year and about 18 months or between one year, yeah, about, about one year and 18 months. In that stage, babies prefer to play by themselves. And they prefer to, to kind of spend <coughs> to time to explore and be busy by themselves, very absorbed in a certain, in a certain task. And this gives them the ability to develop um, cognitive skills and um, as they interact with toys and so on. But so just be able to separate, to distinguish that from the time when a baby is you know, you want to engage the baby in interaction or play, and then they just, they, they, they prefer to go and, and be by themselves and to play with objects. A repetitive use of objects, uh, toys or something, they use just one and keep using it and uh, not 
focus on other things available. Atypical body movement, typically spinning uh, or unusual visual kind of exploration. Sometimes they do things, you know, with their eyes. And um, so th th also these are used as, as a kind of self-stimulation behavior. One child in the school system used to sit down and rock or like this. And also, um, whenever she would go outside for recess, she would go to the swings, just sitting at the swing, spending basically all this time, 20 minutes outside uh, on the swing until the very end. She wouldn't have, you know, interest in, in playing with kids or making friends, nothing. Just, you know, getting out of lunch, going to recess and, and going to the, to the swings. Signs that are noticed around 18 months of age include number one, difficulty directing and focusing attention on a specific person uh, or object. Um, for example, um, that someone else is focusing on, which is joint attention. So by simply not having joint attention, they a whole channel now is missing uh, that could have been used to, to for them you know, to teach them social skills, language skills, and so on, because they don't have that ability to focus, uh, to, to, to perform joint attention. Many, many other areas that depend, or the development of which depends on uh, joint attention, now these areas are not there. Difficulty using pointing or gesturing to direct other people's attention to a person or an object of interest. That is some kind of part of joint attention. In some cases, we use ver words to direct someone else's attention. Oh, look at that. And then you look and the person looks. Um, and in some cases, you don't have to say anything. You just look and they predict and they look. Delayed language skills <clears throat> and um, they have echolalia, or repeating something that someone else says, and palilalia, repeating their own words. Like you say, yeah, I went to the store. I went to the store. I did. I went to the store. I did. So repeating their own words and what they say, I mean, again, palilalia, and then echolalia is repeating someone else's, uh, what they say. So by the age of three, the child shows rigid, repetitive behavior and interests. For example, rocking and swinging, uh, doing things with their hands. Um, the same thing is, is done over and over. And they want to exactly do the same thing over and over, sitting in the same place, eating uh, the same thing. And, and I mean, all of us know, uh, have met people with autism and, and know. But these are important signs that you need to focus on early in development. By age three, the child has language deficits. It doesn't, they might know if they are higher functioning, they might know, uh, they will, might have a adequate vocabulary, <coughs> able to make sentences and everything. But social communication becomes a fundamental, you know, a major deficit for them. Difficulty maintaining and, and making friends because of the social language uh, problem uh, and, and because of theory of mind and because of the, the imitation, uh, mirror neuron. Uh, preference for routines and restricted behavior patterns that remain throughout life and hypersensitivities, including uh, to touch. They don't want people to touch them. Uh, taste, they, you know, have taste preferences, some things that they do not like, and so on, some textures of foods that they do not like, uh, some sounds that can make them agitated, and visual things as well. So based on genetic studies, if one identical twin has an ASD, uh, has ASD uh, autistic spectrum disorder, there's a 60 to 90% chance that the other twin has also the disorder. If one dizygotic twin has ASD, then there's a chance of 10 to 30% uh, that this, um, uh, for example, the other twin is gonna have ASD. 
if a woman has a child with autism, she has a 20% chance of having another child with autism. So approximately 20% of siblings of children with ASD also have ASD. Uh, there are some areas, of course, in the brain that are implicated in the diagnosis of autism, including uh, parts of the cerebellum, the cerebellar vermis. The, this is the cerebellum. It has a right hemisphere, left hemisphere in the middle. It has an area where the right hemisphere is connected with the left hemisphere for integrating information. And then that is connected with the rest of the brain. That area, because it looks like a worm, it is called the vermis. Verm, vermis is verma, worm, it means worm <clears throat> from Latin. So that area is, is, um, is abnormal in people with autism. Uh, med the medial temporal lobe that, again, I mentioned has, has to do with auditory processing, it has to do with memory, it has to do with the uh, emotional processing, um, is also uh, showing abnormalities. And the corpus callosum that connects the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere. 20% of people with autism have what is known as macrocephaly. Cephaly means brain, macro means large. 20% have macrocephaly. However, 80% of the cases <coughs> show that the brain is either the same as typically developing individuals or in some cases smaller, slightly smaller. So again, here's the amygdala. This is part of the temporal cortex, but under, deep in the temporal cortex, the hippocampus, the memory center also, these are both in the temporal cortex. Um, the research shows that the amygdala here, it develops in a different pattern um, in autism. For example, in the average individual, 40, I mean, 40%, um, I mean, the, um, the amygdala the, grows by 40% between ages 8 years and 18 years. And at that time, the rest of the brain is, is decreasing by 10%, because remember pruning and remember cell program, cell death, and all of this cuts down the number of neurons who are born with in half by by the end of the uh, puberty. But in people with autism, the amygdala reaches adult size by age eight. And we go back again to the idea that you have areas of the brain that are tuned and fine-tuned and connected best with sensory stimulation. As you continue performing a skill, imitating and having experiences with the skill, and while the brain is, is growing, you connect and make more um, useful connections. But for people with autism, the amygdala reaches adult size by age eight, and that makes it more kind of arrested, difficult to make new, you know, more connections and so on. Um, it doesn't, it is not shaped by experience as, as you could imagine um, the typical individual, individual's amygdala is. So on the cellular level, um, research shows there's an increase in the white matter volume, especially between ages two and three. White matter is, is made out of the extension, the, the, uh, that um, little thread between the cell body and the ends where the neuron sends signals to another neuron. So there a significant percentage, about 30% have uh, seizure disorders, and these seizures cause damage to the amygdala and other areas, especially in the temporal cortex. There's a lower number of Purkinje cells in the, in the um, cerebellar cortex. So 
I added this image so that you can uh, see. This is the cortex of the cerebellum. It has only three layers, but the 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 rest of the co cortex of the hemispheres it has six layers. The biggest cell in the cerebellum is called Purkinje, named after the person who discovered it. So all these big cells that go on the that have branches, dendria on the top layer, and they send down their you know their axons way down, as you could see them here. They are the Purkinje cells. They are very very important for integrating motor and and sensory information, and they are very very important. So these cells are abnormal. Um, I mean, they are, there's a lower number of them in people with autism. There are defects in the migration of cells way early. Remember, early in the migration process <coughs> during conception. Um, so you have, let's go back here, for example, just use it as, as an example. So you have beneath, this is the cortex of the cerebellum. And beneath it, you have all these extensions going down, all these millions and millions of threads that make the white matter, uh, the, the axons. So to build um, you know, the, the cortex, you have to bring all of these cells, new, new cells, and to have them migrate go up and populate the cortex. But many of them just get, um, uh, as the cells are migrating, they somehow cannot go to the cortex to, to form, uh, you know, parts of the cortex, and they get trapped in the white matter. So these areas are called ectopias. Focal areas where the migrating cells are trapped, and they sit there in the white matter and they can't go to populate. So in one way, they cause an uh, obstruction in the way of the axons that want to travel down to reach other parts of, of the brain, lower parts to integrate information. Uh, you know, uh, fibers that go from right to left or front to back are also obstructed by this ball of of cells that are sitting there no, not having a place, you know, they can't go to the right place. And the other thing is that the place where these neurons are supposed to exist, it doesn't have them now. So that is causing two abnormalities, obstruction and deficiency in the number in, in the areas where they are supposed to travel. There are also uh, fewer neurons in the mature amygdala of individuals with autism. Interestingly, some studies show an enlarged size of the amygdala in people with autism, and, and a substantial number of people with autism. One way to explain why there is an increase in size in, in some people with autism, like macrocephaly and, and also in, in, say, amygdala, one way to explain it is that their brains have more inflammation, that the cells have inflammatory processes that make them larger, uh, and, uh, and that causes abnormalities. So in terms of cognitive and behavioral difficulties associated with autism, uh, there are cog uh, cognitive rigidity, which is problems with cognitive flexibility, disengaging from a given task, difficult, like when they are focused and fixated on something, they are, it is hard to break their focus or direct their attention from this to something else. I worked with a child who, with autism who had a superior, uh, you know, superior intelligence scores. A superior is a word, is, is the term that is used in the 99th percentile. Of course, he wasn't able to complete a math or a writing or even write one sentence by himself if you were not sitting with him and, and 
waiting and giving him many many directions please write your sentence okay do this do that he needed a full-time aid with him every day of the school he could not do anything if you didn't um if the aid was not there so and that i wouldn't call this intelligence the idea of intelligence is having the skills and more importantly translating them into physical things into making you know using them for world functions for doing something in the world if you just know the knowledge and then not use it and not know how to use it then that is not intelligence at all i mean uh, think about the savant in uh, in uh, with people who have autism someone would have a photographic memory and they are able to just look at a page for three minutes read the page and they can read it word by word by word after i mean say it after you take that away not just now but they can read it many many years later they can go page this and this of this book it begins this way and goes that way but that person wouldn't even have the ability to use the bathroom by himself or herself and when we speak about memory and development we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon this area so anyways uh this young man i was telling you about he would sit look at the table it has grains of like the how the grain is kind of of the table is interesting and he would sit and trace and trace and trace and you call his name you several times and he is completely absorbed completely he would go to the bathroom and would take him about i mean one day he went to the bathroom in the afternoon like uh, after they came back from luncheon so he went and everyone was looking and the buses were ready to leave about a couple of hours later <laughs> the buses were ready to leave and they couldn't find him they found him in the bathroom when he actually went to the bathroom <clears throat> he had the, the the school was had a, an, an old building and the sink in the bathroom was quite got big he got some brown paper and and plugged the sink and filled it with soap and water so when i went to get him i found him standing by by the sink and his hands are inside of the water and the whole thing is a lot of soap and he was just massaging his hands and feeling the warm water and staying there for a couple of hours doing exactly just that so you would have severe difficulties in that particular person's um, <clears throat> case disengaging from one thing from one task and starting a new task difficulty planning and managing a sequence of voluntary actions um, by focusing on a task maintaining multiple task demands at the same time exactly while using work in memory to kind of hold information uh, about the two tasks monitoring his own or her own behavior and performance difficulty shifting attention from one task to another so all of these are going to affect social interactions because i mean you, in order to uh, to interact well with someone you have to realize no then the the ideas you have may be different from the ideas they have the way that you like things is going to be different from the way that people other people like things so that cognitive rigidity just goes across social and cognitive and other skills okay these are some of the references and um i hope that um you found this uh, lecture helpful and uh we are going to stop here so thank you